Moving right along, uh, the woman I'm about to bring up here, she um, is a wonderful woman in technology. She has worked with some great startups that you may know, like Flickr. She's written for publications like VentureBeat and also the Wall Street Journal. And because of the Wall Street Journal, she uh, has always had this inclination to look at newspapers and say, you need to think of yourselves as apps now, you know, looking at traditional media and, and how they can continue to move on. So she's very, very passionate about that. And she very recently joined the Wall Street Journal as a product lead and just launched um, Wall Street Journal Social. She led the entire creation of Wall Street Journal Social. It's a standalone publication on Facebook. So make sure you go onto Facebook and you look, at, look that up and try it out because it's really interesting. It's giving you stories that are somewhat based on your own likes and things that you're interested in. So without further ado, I would love to get up on stage Maya Baratz with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Um, I will say that even while you're eating, you should be tweeting. That's actually how Twitter started. People talked about what they like to eat. Um, so I'm Maya, and I'm here to talk to you about a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. It's not about the role of women in technology specifically. It's not about how women should approach finding a role in technology. It's not even about how women should approach success. What I want to talk to you about is how women should approach their lives and how what drives us essentially drives innovation. So by quick show of hands, and please be honest, um, how many of you are waiting for your mentor? Not many. That's good. Um, I'm still waiting. Uh, and how many of you uh, feel stuck because you don't have a mentor? OK, great. Um, now, how many of you are waiting for your true calling? <laughs> That's also great. And last question. This might be a little bit of a tough one, and I'm still going to ask you to be honest. How many of you feel that you need to prove someone wrong? or even every day. How many of you try to prove someone wrong every day? <laughs> Thanks. Um, the reason why I'm asking these questions is that these are all signs of being reactive. We as women, we're very good at being reactive. And that's not such a bad thing. You know, we're really great at catching balls and then you know, keeping our eyes on them both figuratively and literally. But what I want to talk to you about today is about looking at it from the other perspective of being proactive. Now, when I talk about proaction or being proactive, I look at I, I think of like the male terms of offense and defense. So basically, what I'm trying to say is we're playing a lot of defense. We're not playing enough offense. But in, and you might think, you know, why would I want to play offense? Like that sounds really violent. Like why would I want to go out the door every day and try to tackle someone? Um, I'm not advocating that. Uh, and, I, and, and, when I, and you know, when you think of offense, you think of something offensive. You're like, why would I want to offend someone every day? Um, when I think of offense, I actually think of really running your own life, controlling it in a way that you're tying your goals to things that you actively and directly control every day, so that you're taking actions every day towards that goal. That sounds really hokey, but when you actually take it to heart, You'll see what I mean. So all innovation is really driven by playing offense. It's, it's driven by looking at something from the perspective of the angle of, that it hasn't been looked before. It's not looking at it from the perspective of being reasonable, necessarily. OK, so before I go into uh, a few points that I want to make today, I'm just going to preface what I'm going to say by saying that I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. And I will say that I felt a little bit uncomfortable about that. And when I heard Jocelyn speak uh, from Facebook about how we should talk about ourselves, I felt a little bit more comfortable about that. But I'm only going to, you know, I'm only talking about myself. If there's anything that I want anyone to take away from this, is that this is my path that I'm going to tell you about. But I want to encourage you to take your own path and to be proactive about it. The first point I want to make is, um, you know, let's go back to the mentorship question. 
I don't think you need a mentor. Actually, you don't need a mentor. What I mean by that, and I'll explain a little bit, when I was six, four, like five or six years old, I fell in love. I picked up my first pencil and paper and started to draw letters. I was in Israel, so they were in Hebrew. I didn't really know what these letters meant. I didn't really know how to put words together, let alone string sentences together. But I had a spark. I need to do this. I don't know why. I don't know what this might lead to. I mean, I was five or six. Um, but I knew I needed to do it, and I felt passionate about it. So I begged my parents for a diary. I didn't even know how to write yet, but they were like, OK. Um, and I studied words in a way that like, a kid would eat every last bit of cereal in a bowl, you know, like slurping it. I, I really wanted to devour words. Um, I, every word in Hebrew, every word has many, many meanings. I tried to wrap my brain around every meaning of every word that I could possibly use as a toolkit for writing. I collected stationery from everywhere, and I traded it with my friends. I'm not kidding. We were weird kids. Um, when my little brother uh, was four years old, uh, he was kind of, you know, peaked. His interest was peaked in what I was doing, and he, he wanted to participate in what I was doing. So I made him play this game that I made up called Do Not Disturb, where we basically passed <laughs> messages underneath our doors at home. And at some point, I think I actually insisted that this would be our only mode of communication for hours. <laughs> and the reason isn't that I wanted to avoid my brother necessarily, or that I thought he was annoying, was that I really wanted him to feel what it felt like for me to put words on paper, because it just felt like nothing else. I knew, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And so I went on for a few years after that. I was writing short stories. I would drive my parents nuts with them. I would write all night long. I would push off homework to write. And then when I was 11, uh, my family and I took a vacation to the States and decided to move there while we were on vacation. I was confused. I was a key stakeholder in this family, and they were going to uproot me and make me learn a language, one with a completely different alphabet, with characters written in the opposite direction, right? So Hebrew is written from right to left, English is written from left to right. And I picked up my first English book and I cried. I begged to be pulled back in school, but no dice. Well, actually, that's not really true. What my parents told me was that, you know what, if you want to go back in school, just that's fine. You want to start from scratch? Go ahead. I didn't know at the time that they were Tom Sawyering me, probably because I'd never read Tom Sawyer or any book in English. Um, so anyway, I had one summer before school to learn a language that was written in the opposite direction, completely different alphabet, had letters and words that did not make sounds. And the clincher, <laughs> instead of each word having many meanings, every meaning had a thousand words. Like, <laughs> it was the least efficient language to learn ever. <laughs> so I did the reasonable thing. I cried, freaked out, and then went to the mall. Um, mall was a new concept for me at the time. Now there's plenty of malls in Israel. but. Um, and I, in the mall, I found this little store. Uh, it was a Hello Kitty store. And I lit up. Be, and, I, and I was obsessed with Hello Kitty at the time for probably a very different reason than a lot of other people were. They created the stationery that was the most highly coveted stationery that I traded when, with my friends in Israel. And so while I was upset about the whole moving thing, I thought, oh my god, there's this massive store of stationery. I could write letters to my friends about how my life sucks. And, you know, I could have that. Um, the, but the, the catch was, I looked at the stationery, like one package of stationery, is $12. My allowance at the time was $1 a week. <laughs> this isn't that many years ago, I'm not that old, like that was not much, right? So I was thinking 12 weeks to buy one packet of stationery, I was upset. I <laughs> dragged my parents back into the store a second time. Uh, in the desperation to try to get them to, you know, relent and buy me stationery. And then 
I saw this massive sign outside the store the second time I went, and I was like, is that a sale sign? You know, I couldn't read it, but it had like a book on it, and, and uh, I ran up to my dad. I was like, is that a sale sign? Do you think you can buy me stationery? It's on sale. And he looks at me and he goes, that's not a sale sign. They're running a contest. And I was like, okay, what kind of contest? Well, it's a book reading contest. So you basically have to read books. And I was like, in English. He's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then you have to write about the books, you know, in a book report in English. Yeah, okay. And what was the prize? It was a $75 gift certificate. So basically, I'd be rich if I won this. <laughs> I could buy all the stationery. So I started by reading those inflatable baby books that you read your toddlers in the bathtub. It had like one word on a page. Um, I probably used more effort reading each word than inflating the pages. Um, and I started writing reports based on these books where I would actually literally copy every letter down and every word down as if it was a drawing. To me, English was, a, you know, like it's almost Chinese characters to me now. I'm sure one day I'll know Chinese, hopefully. Um, but I started writing down everything and then I would write my opinion and it would be good, bad. Um, and then I kind of grew to, over the course of the summer, this was a summer long contest, I um, read 64 books over the course of the summer, um, worked my way up to fourth grade uh, English, and wrote these reports. I was completely driven by a very consumerist you know, drive to get uh, Hello Kitty stationery. Um, my parents got a call at the end of the summer, and I had won the contest. And I, was, I still consider that one of my biggest accomplishments. Um, <laughs> Somewhere between being obsessed with writing and being obsessed with writing stationery, I just began to teach myself a whole new language, a new toolkit and canvas to write in. I went on years later to write for a number of publications, um, as Amy mentioned, ranging from VentureBeat to SF Weekly to WSJ, um, and then even work on the tech side to try to figure out the canvases of our future. Um, but I didn't do this because I had a mentor. Sure, luck was involved. A lot of other things were involved. There was the contest. There was the fact that I was obsessed with Hello Kitty. Um, there was the fact that my dad actually read the sign. So chance was definitely there. But the contest could have been one of a thousand other prompts that just allowed me to see what I was capable of. I felt empowered. You don't need a mentor. Mentors are great, and if you have one and you're lucky enough to have one, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I can sit and tell you about all the wonderful stories I've heard of people who have had mentors. A lot of our leaders have had great mentors. So if you have one, great. But if you don't, great. You know? Like, you have to think about it as one factor in the number of factors that could change your life. But it's also something that you don't control. So if you can't find a mentor, think about the other things that you can't find. You might not have been born into a rich family. You might not have been born in the right city. There's a number of other things that having a mentor falls uh, alongside with. When you say, I can't do X because I don't have a mentor, you're giving too much power to something that doesn't exist in your life, by virtue of it not existing. Waiting for a mentor is like waiting for Godot, if anyone's read that. It's absurd. Um, most importantly, waiting for a mentor is waiting to follow someone else's lead. Follow your own. I have a favorite quote, and it's by a man, so I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> we don't have to hate them. Um, and it's by George Bernard Shaw, and it's, reasonable people adapt to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to themselves. All progress, therefore, depends on unreasonable people. Which brings me to my second point. You don't need to be reasonable. Innovation rests on creativity and passion, sprinkled with reason. Use reason to make tactical advances towards your goal, but feel free to be completely unreasonable in making those goals. I wanted to write. And I wanted to learn the technology to figure out the future of how I'm going to write. And I wanted to do it all, despite the fact that I still needed to take the micro steps of learning a completely foreign language from scratch. When I was in high school, I noticed that things were changing. People were starting to read their news on websites. And anyone could create a website, a blog. 
What did that mean for the paper canvas? What did that mean for journalism, for being an editor? I was curious, I was interested. So I studied computer engineering in high school and college. But it wasn't because I wanted to study computer engineering. It was because I saw it as an interesting tool and a means to an end. I had no idea what that end was, but I just followed the path that felt right to me. When I got out of college, I worked for a bunch of uh, small startups and companies, including Flickr, to wrap my brain around building uh, things online. And one of those companies was Monster.com. Anybody heard of Monster? It's like one of the web 1.0 companies. Um, and when I was there in the early 2000s, uh, I was an editor and producer uh, for a career advice area of the site, which basically meant that I had to populate web pages for a living, whether by writing content, editing it, or hiring somebody to write it, and then I would edit it. But what I found particularly interesting were the comments people were posting on our message boards. And this is before the time that comments were actually you know, below the content. You would separate them, like church and state. Um, they were separated uh, where people could write on literally message boards. And I thought, the stuff people are writing here can probably help other people. The content people are producing on our site through these message boards is content. So I thought it would be cool to run a contest leveraging uh, what people say publicly on the message board, a toxic boss contest. Um, I thought it would be fun to basically reward people who came up with the craziest stories of how bad their bosses were, because I've had bad experiences, um, who could gather up the insanity and the courage to write their stories out in the open for anyone to see. I wanted a big splashy page and ads pushing against it. I wrote up this Jerry Maguire-esque memo. I even wrote up the ads for it. I was like, what? We have house ads. That doesn't cost any money. Um, I went ahead and asked the designer to craft the ads uh, and put the request in for the house ad. And when I finally approached my boss, I was thinking this is the right tactic, right? Like, get it all done, show it to the boss with my manifesto, and it'll happen. The response was kind of like, meh. This is how, you know, literally, she said to me, this sounds childish, completely off-brand. Um, and then when they had heard that I actually created house ads, they thought I completely lost it. Um, I'm pretty sure I was very close to getting fired, actually. Anyway, I basically failed in convincing my superiors this would be an interesting and lucrative tactic for the company. So I didn't go about it the right way. Maybe I should have used the uh, appropriate channels, but I didn't want to let it go. So I kept pushing. What if we pulled back the ads? No. <laughs> what if we pulled back the splash page? What if I just ran it on our message boards? where people will already write whatever they want. OK, fine. They let me do that. One, to shut me up. Also, it didn't cost us anything. And they figured if people can you know, get talking more on the message boards, that can't be bad. More page views, et cetera. So go ahead. I was psyched. The contest was a complete island on the website in our message boards. But I was happy because one, I still had my job. And two, I figured, OK, cool. So this could be a fun experiment. We got a call about a week later from a big publication, I think it was Business Week, and called our PR, our head of PR, and they were like, what's this toxic boss contest thing? I had never met our head of PR. I was, you know, um, a producer. And quickly she found her way towards me, and then I had to go through three hours of media training so that I could, you know, answer questions about what the toxic boss contest was about. Um, <laughs> The contest led to about five months of you know, unpaid media attention. We kind of rode the wave of a lot of other things that happened. There was this movie called The Devil Wears Prada that just happened to you know, happen around the time that we ran it, um, extended our story. Articles on other publications were written on the topic. It was kind of a whirlwind. By the end of the year, I went from almost being fired to having toxic boss brought up at the company's earnings call. We picked up a Webby Aware that year, too. My five-word speech was, note to self, update resume. And I did. <laughs> um, I went on to work for Flickr, uh, one of the emerging platforms at the time that rested on this new concept called social media. Um, it was a platform that basically allowed people to create and share content. 
But I had no idea I'd be interested in learning more about that if I did the reasonable thing and just kept trucking along with my job and not paying any attention to that spark when I felt it. And generally speaking, if we were reasonable about the web and applied the same rules we did with print, parsing out people's notes to the editor or you know, their message board from our content, social media and user curation wouldn't really become what it has. We had to be unreasonable. You don't need to be reasonable. But in order to do so, I and we had to be OK with the notion of failing. Which brings me to my third point. You don't need to succeed. Year after year, we'll see these studies that cite that, on average, female-owned businesses are more successful than men's. Women-led startups have far fewer failures than men-led startups. Good for us, right? Clearly, we have nothing to worry about. But women make up less than 10% of venture-backed startups. As of last year, only 14 women of 208 had been funded by Y Combinator, which is a prestigious seed stage startup funding firm. 14 out of 208, and that was last year. The metrics people use to express how much more successful female-led businesses are than men's is also one I like to use when describing the dating scene at MIT or at Silicon Valley. The odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> I don't mean that the companies women start are strange at all. I mean that they're not as ubiquitous. Women are shy of taking big risks. We are prone to be cautious and ensure that we could succeed before we move forward. But we don't need to succeed. In fact, ensuring success is pushing us back from taking the big risks that innovation heavily relies on. I'll say what a lot of people have said over and over again, especially recently. Fail fast, early, and often. If I tried to go into every personal example of failure, we'd be here for a while, so I'm going to spare you. I failed the first time I tried to read English. I failed the first time I tried to convince my superiors at Monster that we needed to run a toxic boss contest. And these are things that eventually succeeded. I failed at many other things. Failure is feedback. And I'm not talking about failures caused by sloppiness or laziness. I don't think we even need to talk about that. We all work our butts off. Good failure is failure that cre comes from creating something that you believed in is good but you had no proof that it will succeed because you haven't tried it yet. But in order to, for failure to be feedback, you really need to speed up your recovery process by failing fast and often. What I mean by that is that you shouldn't spend your time reacting to failure. When we fail, everyone goes through a bereavement period. It's very difficult. Like, it's impossible to not to skip that, right? Everyone goes through the same period of you know, re emotionally reacting to it. But this is the thing. If you get stuck on the anger side, you'll probably be stuck there for a while. If you own your own failure, if you learn from it, if you dust yourself off and move on, then you'll be fine. You'll be proactive. It's like making yourself fall while you're skiing. You know how you're going to fall. You know how you're going to get up. And you're going to get better at it over time. My friend Alexia Totsis, who writes for TechCrunch, shared a handwritten note the other day on Instagram uh, that said, I'd rather have a life of oh wells than what ifs. True innovation is about approaching things that haven't been approached before. It's about taking a leap of faith. And that almost always means taking risks, which can lead to failure. But don't take my word for it. Follow your own path. And if you have a great mentor, wonderful. If you don't, that's great too. Do what you can do to keep moving forward. And don't just let yourself move forward. Push your female colleagues to do the same. Part of appreciating that every woman is empowered to pave her own path is exactly that. Respecting the fulfillment of your female colleagues' goals. Support each other. We should have our, we all have our own opinions, and we should. We should even argue them with each other. But I'd urge that from a 30,000-foot view, we have each other's backs. 
and support the fact that each one, one of us wants to crave your own path. Let's proactively create a, a tight-knit community and system of ongoing support, feedback, and slack. So we don't have to keep searching for mentors or be fearful of being unreasonable or failing. Let's stop trying to prove others wrong. Let's try to prove ourselves right by being proactive, innovative, pushing ahead, and allowing ourselves to fall in love over and over again with our lives and our careers. Thank you. I guess we'll sit down now and then we'll do some questions if we have some time at the end. Sure. Sounds great. Okay. Well, I can say that I have supported Maya from the 30,000 foot view oh, <laughs> for a while. Really but we haven't had a chance to do this, so it's really wonderful to, to be here together, you know, and for all of us to share and, and embrace. So, let's start there. Um, wow. So many amazing words. Oh, <laughs> I, I love what you just ended with, you know, let's start proving ourselves right. Um, you know, it, are there any examples that, that you can focus on in terms of your own career where you've seen, you know, maybe someone stumble um, that, and they've, they've kind of focused on the negative. How, how, do, you, how do you help another woman uh, kind of turn that corner? She's angry, she's failed, she's stuck in that muck. How do you help her get up? How can we help each other get up? That's a great question. Um, I could give you my answer, but um, I think the way to do that, and I've done it again and again, and other friends have done that for me, is remind somebody that, one, like a couple things. One, you're in a moment. That moment's going to pass. When you fail, the worst thing you could do is either pretend like it didn't happen, not learn from it, um, and not move on. And the thing about it is that women are so scared, we're so scared of failure that we think of it as like an end, right? Mm -hmm. When in reality, failure is, is it, it's feedback, you know? It's like putting something out in beta. Think of your life in beta, right? You know, you're gonna have bugs. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you could just zap those bugs, right? Like it just yeah. happens, right? So um, that's, what, that's what I would mm -hmm. do, or approach. And I think uh, something you and I talked about before we even got up on stage is Again, a theme throughout the, the conference thus far has been women not telling their stories, being too humble, like, oh, I can't toot my own horn, and we're afraid of failure, but yet we're not talking about our success. Why is it so important for us to share our successes? Uh, it's incredibly important. I think definitely we don't toot our own horn. I love discovering about, I mean, we were just talking about this earlier, like discovering that things that you use every day that w were invented by women. The fact that we don't know uh, that other women have done these amazing things, does it, it almost doesn't give, you know, it, 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 it makes us feel a lot more boxed in, mm -hmm. right? We don't have role model, mod, models to look for, to look up to. We don't have um, other women that are just talking about things that, you know, like the idea of looking for a mentor, the reason why I say that, um, that I, I hope that that almost kind of phases out is that, you know, if everyone in your community is talking about what they're doing, you learn from everyone. You don't learn from one person, right? right. And you want to be able to continuously learn from those people over your life. Um, and so that's why it's incredibly important for every single person to tell their story because you're really, we're creating a tight-knit community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really what's going to help us move forward. Mm -hmm. And just really quick show of hands. I mean, out of the conversations and all the networking that you've done here at the conference, how many of you have met someone that has just told you something phenomenal that they've done or that just has inspired you in some way or, or you've learned a tidbit from them that made you go, oh, wow, now, now I have my missing piece. I realize that this is what I've been doing and this is the box I've been in. Here's where I can go now. How, how many of you have gotten that sort of feedback here? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's really cool. Okay. Uh, you talk a lot about, you know, you don't need a mentor. 
would you say that it's more about really owning things yourself, owning who you are, what you want to be, what your goals are, and just sort of owning your career and yourself as a person before having, an, having a mentor can be as effective? Would you say that's a fair statement? Um, I think the thing about a mentor is that I almost look at it as, well, A, if you're lucky enough to have one, that's great. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, a lot of it has to do with luck, right? Like, like the fact that you might you know, meet somebody uh, in, in, in this conference has to do with luck. And the thing that bothers me about that is that if you're stuck waiting for something that you can't control, you're going to feel helpless. Mm -hmm. So if you're stuck waiting for a mentor, and you're like, oh, I could be more successful if I had a mentor. Most people don't have them, yeah. right? So I think that it's, it's more about like, feeling stuck. And I think like, like the one thing that I, 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 I like to think about is that if, like, think of mentorship as one of the many, many, many tools that you can use in your toolkit. So if you don't have a mentor, what else do you have? What can you act on? Um, and that's really, really key. So I don't think that mentorship is bad. I think if you're lucky enough to have a great mentor, that's excellent. But don't right. wait for one. Right. It also seems like we as women tend to look at, you're saying, feeling out of control. Uh, we look at luck a lot. We've talked about that quite a bit at the conference, too, this notion of serendipity versus strategy. Right. Um, let's use your own career as an example. You know, now you've moved on. You, you were working with startups, and then you, you moved along to a product role at the Wall Street Journal. How did that come about? I know that as you know, we're peers, I'm thinking, wow, how did, how did you just do this? You know, was it something that was handed to you? It was it luck, or was it you going? You know what? I have a passion for this, and I'm going to find a way to make it happen. Or was it a mix? Uh, it was definitely a mix. I can't even tell you how many notes I wrote people on LinkedIn. More paper. Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> I I wrote quite a few notes. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wrote a piece a couple years ago about how I thought newspapers should be apps, and then. I realized that I needed to put my money where my mouth was, and so I knew I wanted to do that, but the role didn't really exist, so I started harassing people on LinkedIn. <laughs> do you guys need somebody to do this for you? Um, and I had interviewed for a bunch of roles, and then it was two hours before I was supposed to catch my flight back from New York to California. I lived in San Francisco for a few years. Um, that I got a call from um, you know, the chief product officer of uh, our company, of Wall Street Journal, who's now my boss, and he's like, do you have a couple hours, do you have like a, you know, can you stop by before your flight? And I did, and, you know, we hit it off so well, and we were both really in sync, and uh, that ended up being my job. So it was a little bit of a mix, I guess, of, of wanting, knowing what I want, and then having a little bit of luck. And being able to identify the opportunity when it presented itself. Yeah. So two hours before your flight. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah, if somebody calls you two hours before, it doesn't matter if you're wearing jeans, just go. <laughs> yes, that was one of, the first things, one of the first things she says to me, I was wearing jeans. It was. It's pretty bad. It's like a Mad Men uh, office, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> and something that really resonated with me that you were just talking about, too, is this notion of, you know, we're often told, oh, that's so unreasonable. Stop being unreasonable. Oh, that's crazy. And as women, when we hear that, it's like, <gasps> Oh no, somebody thinks word. I'm crazy, yeah. oh that C <laughs> word, you know, and, and then you, you kind of back off. But I just sat there and went, wow, I can be unreasonable and that can be a good thing. That's definitely a good thing. Most, I mean, it's funny because a lot of men like to, uh, if you think, if you listen to a lot, uh, the way that a lot of men talk about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you'll see that they all say the same thing. They're all, they're like, we're crazy, we're good with that. Right? It's okay for a man to be crazy. But you know what? It's okay for anyone to be a little bit insane. And I don't mean crazy in the sense that like, you know, you, you're hurting yourself or others, but in the sense that you have an idea, you don't really think it would work. In fact, no one's done it before. And you're like, this doesn't sound right. You, you spin it by a couple of people and they're like, I don't know. That doesn't mean that it's a bad idea. When I first started thinking about putting the Wall Street Journal on Facebook, you'd imagine that it was, it was a new concept, so it was kind of, you know, it, it, it took a few conversations, but I felt really passionately about it, you know, and it, I saw it as another platform. Didn't see it very differently from the iPad or, the, or, the, or your iPhone or any of your Android devices. So, you know, really kind of, um, you know, pushing forward on whatever idea you have and don't self-judge. Don't say, okay, that's crazy, so that mm -hmm. doesn't work for or me. Or be self-critical. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. 
Um, how, you know, your degree obviously lends itself really well to where you're at. Um, so would you say that, you know, any, any kind of math, science, engineering degree, are, are you, do you see other women that are sort of taking those degrees in unique directions like you have? Um, I think I definitely have. And I actually don't think that you need necessarily a specific degree mm -hmm. to to get into this role, um, a lot of it is a lot of a lot of um, a lot of it is really self-taught. I mean, this industry is changing so fast mm -hmm. that you can't rely on what you learned in college right. or grad school or whatever to to move forward in your career. You just you need to learn and absorb from everyone around you, from reading. You know, just like just take in your your environment and what you're passionate about and don't stop learning, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like a cheesy phrase, but it's true. I, I didn't stop learning in college. I was supposed to go to law school, by the way. I took my LSATs. I, I was on the way to law school. Um, I think my parents still think that I'm deferring it. Um, <laughs> I really thought I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, and then I just, you know, I, I, I kind of felt like I wasn't really following my heart. So, um, so school's great, and especially the relationships that you build in school. I went to Wellesley, um, and it was the first time I really built relationships with other women. Um, and I think the relationships that you build in school are probably more important than what you actually learn. So. Mm -hmm. And I mean, another question too, just another show of hands. How many of you feel like in your everyday lives with work, you know, do you, that you have that group of women that you go to? You work in tech, so do you have? small groups of women that you rely on that have your back on the job site. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's great. And the ones that don't raise your hands, if you don't have those women, you know, where, where are you going to find that person who has your back? That's a question to really ask. If, if they're not at your job site, they're through witty, yeah. <laughs> things like that. But okay. You'll find them. You'll find them, exactly. Um, do we want to open it up to any questions from the audience? Rick, do we have our microphones? I know sure. you probably have some questions too. I don't want to take up all the time. <coughs> okay, so there's a microphone back here. Anybody have any questions? Over here. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story with us. It was oh, very thanks. inspiring. Thank so you. my question is about some of the values you mentioned, like not being afraid of failure, like not waiting on a mentor. I think these are things that a lot of us can agree are good things that we aspire to. But unfortunately, the reason that we are often held back comes from really almost force of habit or emotionally ingrained reasons. So even if you know you want to become the person that's not waiting on a mentor, that is brave enough to be unreasonable, do you have any suggestions for people who are at that point where they've made the decision but just don't know what actually techniques to employ to become aware of when they're holding themselves back and not even knowing it? Uh, it's a really great question. Um, I think really it comes down to doing what you love. So everything, like, like it's, it's almost like when you think about, and I only bring this up because I, I really love baking, but if you were thinking about, like, I really want to make the strawberry shortcake, would you start thinking, okay, what if the, you know, like I, I know I need to get this specific strawberry to go in the cake. Like all of these things are ingredients, right, to, to make this bigger goal, which is to make this cake. So if you don't get that specific strawberry, you're probably going to find another one, right? If you don't find your mentor, there's probably going to be something else in your toolkit. But you need to kind of like always think on the very, um, the higher level perspective of what's your actual goal? What do you want, right? Um, what do you love doing? You know, find a way to do it. Right, so I think it's really about you know keeping your eye on that versus worrying about you know what's in your toolkit. And you can always substitute different things when you're baking, and the cake still comes out just fine. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. I've My used Diet Dr Pepper one. once in cake. Go Nana Mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> oh come on. Anybody? Any? Oh, there's one back there. Back here? Thank you very much. My name is Connie Harriman with Applied Concepts Creativity. Oh. I had the good fortune to grow up with eight brothers. Wow. And uh, so they prepared me for the corporate world. It, from <laughs> <laughs> they knocked me down many times, so I fell fast and got up quickly. 
<laughs> so I guess my question is, from your perspective, what are the dynamics between, you know, and you've touched on it a little bit, but what advice would you give to the women in the room about lessons learned about the way men interact just in terms of running meetings and, you know, you know just something, tidbits along that line? Because I know that there are differences because I've experienced it myself. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm still learning along the way, but uh, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg that said, you know, sit, you have to sit at the table. Um, it's a really important piece, actually. Uh, if you don't really push yourself to be, to, you know, if you don't trust yourself enough to say, you know, I deserve to be here. I deserve to run this meeting. I deserve to, tell, to, to ask people to do things for me, right? And I think that that's the attitude that men sort of take for granted. Like, they're bo either they're born with it or, you know, society allows them to. But, and, and I don't mean to be sexist in saying men versus women, because I think a lot of women also have this. But it's just kind of like, you know, understanding, appreciating that you, you just own yourself. You know, like when you walk into a room and you're in a meeting and you want to run it, don't try to think about what everyone else in the room is thinking about you or whether you're being too aggressive, or whether you're going to be perceived as such and such. Just think, you know what? I deserve to be in this role. And these are the goals that we want to reach as a group, as a company. And I'm pushing this company towards those goals, right? Not, I'm a woman. I'm sitting in a room, and people are going to judge me. So assertive does not have to equal aggressive. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, what a concept. <laughs> Great way of putting it. Anybody else? Anyone? How long did it take you to finally be able to speak as eloquently as you do, to read the way that you do, and to write the stories that you do? Oh my god, that's such a nice compliment. I don't even know how to answer that. Um, uh, thank you. I'm going to just answer it with thank you. That's very nice of you to You're say. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> feel the love in the room. <laughs> I've failed many times. As I said, like, I failed many times. I, um, it, it's just giving yourself slack. It's saying, mm -hmm. you know what? Like, I, I remember trying to write cursive in English, and I thought, this country is crazy. Like, <laughs> you, like first you have words. And I studied, I studied Middle English when I was in college because I, like, really needed to understand why some words have letters in them that don't make sounds, like slight. <laughs> right, or uh, many other words. Um, so, you know, I found that really interesting. And, but, and I, there are many times, I mean, there are many times where I literally was like hand, in, you know, like head in hands, like completely feeling overwhelmed. But, you know, it's, you know, it, right now when that sort of thing can happen, and, you know, that thing can happen at any point, like you think it's just a moment, I'm going to get through it, and then, you know what, I'll probably end up doing all right. Like, no matter what, I don't know how this is going to all end, but I'm just going to follow what I think I should do right now and take the actions that I think I can take right now. I can't control the future. I can't control other people. I can control what I can do right now. So what can I do? Um, and it's taking those two things to heart that really kind of have helped me push through to do what I want to do. I don't think I've answered your question. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that was all really great. Thank you. Any other questions from you guys? No. Here oh, there's go. one more back there. Okay, both sides. Let's go here first. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Sylvie McCleary. Um, one thing I have to applaud you for is that you realized at a really young age that you can have more than one career or one outlet. What advice do you give to other women to actually see? Be, um, what they could actually do that leads them into other directions, that things change with different ages, et cetera. So what advice would you give? It's a great question. I think especially in technology, things move really fast. Like if you were to ask me what I would be five years ago, you know how like they used to have that question, like what do you want to be in five years? I think it's a completely moot question, especially if you want to work in tech, right? Yeah. In five years, I'm going to be a cyborg. Um, <laughs> I mean, not so far from the truth, but, um, but I, I think that the, you know, the notion of like being able to control your destiny is, is something that we just have to see as a fallacy, right? Like we could just basically like, instead of trying to think like, 
do I want to end up being the president of the United States? Just think, what do I want to be next year? What do I want to be in six months? What do I want to be next week? What do I want to eat for lunch today? <laughs> right? Things that you can actually control on a daily basis because that's really what's going to make you feel empowered. If you think that you want to one day become you know, something amazing and like you want to own your own business and things like that, I think it's a really great goal to have and I think you should keep that to heart. But don't stress yourself out figuring, you know, thinking about, oh God, you know, I just turned 30, that means I'm going to die soon. Or, you know, like, you know, things, you know, like things that women think about, you know, when, when we were like, I didn't reach my goal, I didn't write my book, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. Like, don't think about failure as a stopping point or don't think about your career path as something that has one end. Think of it as if you're lucky and if you're smart, which you all are, uh, which we all are, um, then you're going to follow what you love and you're going to do what you love, right? Because that's the best thing you could do. It's not about what other people think. It's not about your, your role or what you do. But if you get to do what you love and get paid for it, you won, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it's really about following that passion that you have. So I hope. I'm sure. Isn't it amazing how the thing we put our focus on is the one thing that gets the most power? If we focus on failure, well... We can bring in more failure if we focus on the positive things, then we bring more positive things to us. Totally. Yeah. I have more of a comment than a question because we've heard a lot, I think, this weekend about what we do and about what we don't do and what we need to do in order for us to be successful. And in given um, speaking to a lot of people here, if you came in and you were looking for a mentor and you don't have one, look around your table and share with each other. If you're not sure who to go to, find someone here. I think if you came here and on Saturday you had the mindset that you weren't good enough, that you couldn't do it, that you didn't have enough time, or that there wasn't anybody to look up to, or there wasn't anybody to, any good examples, I hope that's over now, yeah. right? <laughs> so from this day forward, don't ever say that ever again. Don't ever <laughs> think that ever again. And if you don't feel empowered when you leave here, it, it might be time to do something else and, and be somewhere else because we're in a room of <laughs> powerful, <laughs> successful women who know that we can succeed regardless of what our sex is. And I think all of us are, came here because we are empowered and we need to empower others. So Very well just said. That. To that point, one thing I keep asking all of you when I run into you is, tell me one thing about yourself that you're proud of. Tell me something that you've done that you can own, that, that you can say, I am really good at this. Maya, what are you really good at? Oh, God, really? Um, <laughs> what am I really good at? Uh, and own I it. Mean, that's, I mean, I, I'm talking about writing, so I guess it would be something different than that. Um, Isn't that crazy that you can't, I can't think of one thing? Like, actually, that's, I think that that's actually... Tell, talk to us about the internal process, because my internal so process weird. is, I could say this, but that's not really good enough. Or I could say that, but that's silly. Yeah, or, like, or I could say this, but they'll think I'm weird. It's a great point. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff that passed through. I'm like, I'm really good at baking. I'm really good at playing Nintendo. That's a uh, great one. Or used to be, anyway. Um... I'm really good at writing backwards. I love dancing. See, we could go on like this all day. Yeah. Like we could just humble bragging. Um, yeah, there's many things. Any anything I love. Like I love. I I do love writing and I love dancing. So I tend to be good at those things. I think you tend to be good at the things that you actually enjoy. Um, shockingly, and I and I and I do love product. So I love the best thing I I do well. I think and that I love doing is building something from nothing coming up with an idea and then seeing it actually be used by somebody else, right? So um, WSJ Social, which was my latest thing that I built for, um, for, uh, for the Wall Street Journal, was probably a, a good example, a good recent example of something that I didn't think was gonna actually happen. And then a few months later when it happened and I started having friends call me up and be like, you know what's broken? You know what you should fix? You know what you <laughs> I felt so excited because I was like, this was just this tiny idea. And then it turned into a thing that people played with. So 
that's, I think that. You're good at taking your passion and turning those ideas into something real. Yep. I guess that would be it. Well, congratulations for that, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, any other questions? Are we good? Any more? We have a few more minutes. Don't you have to answer the same question? I think you do. <laughs> Fine, I will. One thing I'm really good at, the Scottish Highland fling. <laughs> I, I don't know that. I don't even know what that is. That's amazing. It's a dance. It's a traditional, it's a traditional dance. You want to see it? Yes. Fine, this is turning into show and tell. Could it, could it turn into a class? I'm taking my shoes off. I cannot believe I'm about to do this. That's amazing. I'm, I'm turning the mic off. Yeah, if you guys aren't on Twitter is right going now. To die. <laughs> I learned this in the fifth grade. I was in, I was in a, dance, a dance troupe on the SWAT team, this really important dance team in Maine. And I'm of Irish and Scottish descent, so I'm at war with myself. Can I take and a class after this? <laughs> with a little Amazing. bit of French. And I learned this in the fifth grade, and I've never forgotten it, and I was always very proud of it. So I'll show you one piece, just one piece. All right, let's see if we can do this. Ready? You can if you want to once I start. Maya, you didn't know that you were going to get up here with a clown, did you? Uh, what are you going to do for your next trick? <laughs> Je ne sais pas. Okay, that was amazing. I think we need to give her a hand for that. It took a lot of courage. <laughs> My mother is going to be dying of laughter later. Anyway. So, Maya Barats, everyone, Wall Thanks, Street Journal. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>